Hello! This is part one of a two-part video where I review all of the books that I read in 2021. So I'm gonna go through each of the 52 books that I read this past year and I'm gonna give you like a short review slash my thoughts. I'm also gonna let you know like how many stars I gave the book on the story graph. If you also use the story graph by the way, please send me a friend request because I love snooping on like what books people are reading at any given point in time. Now the reason why I'm splitting this video up is obviously because if I had put all 52 books in one video it would have been insanely long um, but full disclosure I did film part one of the video yesterday night after I roll the intro you are going to see me in a different outfit with a different makeup look at a different time of the day I'm also aware that like January is coming to a close but whatever this is like a monster video to try and film a monster video to try and edit life happens people get busy and I did want to film this video regardless of how late it was just so I had like a record for posterity of all of the books that I read in 2021 so without any further ado let's get it Okay, so I have my story graph open on my phone and I'm gonna go through the books in the order in which I read them but actually now that I think about it maybe what I should do first is I should talk about four books that I like started reading but then like did not finish in 2021. Three of the books that I DNF'd I DNF'd only because I like ran out of time right like life got really busy and hectic and I ended up having to return the copies that I had to the library and I have every single intention of picking these books back up and finishing them. Let me start getting ready let me not just stare at you. So the three books that I'm definitely going to finish at some point this year are The Seven Husbands of Evelyn Hugo, My Year of Rest and Relaxation, and Dune. Now the one book that I'm like probably never going to finish in my entire life is A Little Life by Hanya Yanagihara. I started reading A Little Life in December of 2020 when I was quite frankly at like a very very low point in terms of like my mental health and stability and it is a very very bleak and hopeless book and the author deliberately constructed it to be so. The message of the book is basically Basically, like fundamentally you are alone and life is sometimes terrible and it doesn't get better and I think if you are like a perfectly mentally healthy person and you enjoy reading like tragic shit you might really love a little life right a lot of people clearly do but I think if you are a person who is like struggling how can I say this euphemistically so I don't get demonetized if you are prone to bouts of melancholia so to speak I just think the message of this book is not one that is constructive or useful to you at all because I think the thing that you would need to hear, the thing that I needed to hear is like you are not alone. Everybody in this world doesn't like hate you. There are lots of people in your life who genuinely care about you and will help you and however shitty like this moment feels it, it is not forever. Life is not bleak. The only constant thing in life is change. That is not the message that Hanya Yanagihara is providing. And I'm not saying Miss Hanya should have given the same message that I'm delivering to you right now as part of her book. Like, not at all. I think people should be able to write about whatever they want to write about. I think people should be able to write incredibly bleak fiction if they want to. But I think there also needs to be an acknowledgement that like not every message is for every single person. And, and this is a book that was like very, very hyped up. And people were recommending this book with reckless abandon, without a single thought for who exactly could come across the message of this book and be hurt or harmed in any way. Because like people undergo severe trauma in this book and the message that this book seems to tell you is that like if you undergo trauma like you will never recover from it. You are a broken person for the entire rest of your life and I just feel like that is such a like overdone and garbage narrative, right? Because so many people who have undergone like a terrible thing happening in their lives they, they already feel like they are perhaps like broken and ruined in some way forever and the thing that they need to hear is not like a validation of their like worst inner fears but instead like a strong acknowledgement that like no you will get through this, this too shall pass. But I don't know. That's just my opinion. I said what I said. I spent a lot of time talking about this book that I like did not finish but like damn I really got like I got 400 pages into this book before I did not finish it and I'm so glad I didn't read like the remainder of it because I think if I hadn't accidentally gotten spoiled for the ending and realized that like this book never turns a corner like it never gets better like the main character's life is miserable from start to finish and like the author did that on purpose given like the mental state that I was in at the time I was reading that book I think I would have been like really severely damaged had I gotten all the way to the end. Uh, so A Little Life by Ms. Hanya Yanagihara, like that book is not for me. I don't know if any of, of Hanya Yanagihara's books are for me, like she gives me a very much so like a depressed Fujoshi vibe and I just like I don't have time for that energy in my life, <laughs> you know? 
So those four books are all of the books that I did not finish. Now let's talk about the 52 books that I actually read. So the first book that I read in 2021 was The Pink Triangle, The Nazi War Against Homosexuals by Richard Plant. And I rated this book four stars. It's basically like a really excellently researched general overview of the way in which homosexuals were persecuted by the Third Reich. I think it was an excellent book. However, I don't think you need to sit down and actually read the entire book to get all of the information. Because there's this incredible YouTube channel by a guy called James Somerton. And I love all of his video essays, but he has like an hour long sort of video essay slash documentary, which is heavily based off of this Richard Plant book that I read. But it has the added benefit of not just being like words on a page, it is like a documentary. There's a lot of like visual aid and support. So I think if you're curious to find out about the treatment of homosexuals under the Third Reich, um, I'm going to link James Somerton's video essay up in the cards. And I think if you spend like an hour of your life watching that documentary on YouTube, um, you will get all of the information out of the Richard Plant book that I read in January in a way that is probably more entertaining than the book itself. Okay, so the next book is another book that I read for my History of the Holocaust class. It is the Journal of Hélène Baer. Hélène Baer was a French Jewish woman who was studying, I believe, literature at university. And this book is literally a translation of her actual diary that she maintained during the German occupation of France. Given that it is a diary, it is beautifully written. Like, man, I have never written a journal entry half as good as any of the shit Hélène Baer ever wrote. So so I did not give this book a star rating because I just felt like it would be really, really disrespectful. Hélène Baird did not survive the war, she died in a camp, and it feels wrong to put star ratings on her literal diary entries that she had like absolutely no intention of ever publishing. But if you want to be like really, really depressed and devastated, but also educated on like what life was like for French Jews in occupied France, go read the journal of Hélène Baird. The next book that I read was Fearing the Black Body, The Racial Origins of Fat Phobia by Sabrina Strings. And this was my first five star read of the year. It's a nonfiction book about sort of like the history of fat phobia in Europe and America specifically, and how this aversion to fatness is intricately tied to racism and specifically anti blackness. And it is just like, it is such an incredible nonfiction book. Sabrina Strings is insanely smart. This is a very, very like interdisciplinary cross-disciplinary novel. Because in tracing the history of fatness, like you don't just get some like dry ass socio-political historical novel. Like at one point, Sabrina Strings is like teaching you art history. Like I learned a lot about like Renaissance art while reading Fearing the Black Body. And it is just like one of those books where ever since I have finished reading it, it has not like left my head. I think about like observations that Sabrina Strings made in Fearing the Black Body at least a couple times a week when I am just like going about my day-to-day -day life. It was like a paradigm shifting, life-changing book for me. It like changed the way I understand my body. It changed the way I understand like the discourse around fatness in America. It was just like, it's a game changer. It deserves every single one of the five stars that it got. Everyone should read this book, especially if you live in North America, like read this book. Like don't even think about it. Read this book. Next up, we have Our Prisons Obsolete by Angela Y. Davis, which I rated four stars. This was also like, a very very informative book. I think the reason why I rated it four stars was that it was like a very short book and I felt like I still had like so many more questions at the end of it, especially like towards the end when she was kind of talking about like prison abolition and its alternatives. I felt like she just sort of like presented the ideas in them without really explaining them, which I guess it kind of makes sense because like this book is more to answer the question of like what's wrong with prisons as opposed to like well what are alternatives to prisons. She's trying to answer the question of are prisons obsolete, not like what should we replace prisons with. With. And she has like other speeches and texts and writings and there are lots of other people who have talked about like well what are alternatives to prisons as a system. Um, it, it is also like a slightly older book so the stats presented in it are definitely like out of date but the ideas presented in it still very much so relevant to this day. I think if you want like a really good introduction to like what goes on with the American prison system and like why it's so jacked and why so many people are like against the idea of prisons as a whole, I think Our Prisons Obsolete is an excellent starting point. But like I said, it is not a text which is going to handhold you through what the alternatives to prison are like. So this is a great starting point, but it is not the be all end all of the conversation around like prisons and abolition. 
Okay, next up we have My Brother's Husband Volume 1 by Gengoro Tagame, translated by Annie Ishii. So My Brother's Husband is a Japanese graphic novel. It is a manga with two volumes. I read both of the volumes and I rated both of the volumes 4.75 stars because it is just such an incredibly like heartwarming and beautiful story. So the story is about a pair of brothers. I think they might even have been twins, I can't remember. And one of them is gay and his gayness causes him to sort of be like a little bit estranged from his family. He moves away from Japan to Canada. He marries a Canadian man called Mike and then he dies. The brother back in Japan, he marries like a woman and he has a child. And after his like gay brother's death, the Canadian husband, Mike comes to Japan to visit. And so now this man who has been like a little bit estranged from his brother ever since he like found out that his brother was gay has to sort of deal with the presence of his brother's husband in his life. It's a book about homophobia and not the sort of like blatant yelling a slur at a person homophobia that you witness out on the street, but the quieter homophobia that the friends and family members of so many queer people have. And the process of having to sort of unlearn all of the like harmful and terrible lies that society has told you about the way that like queer people supposedly are. Like, listen, this is definitely not a novel written for queer people. This is a novel that is written for straight people because it's essentially a novel about like helping straight people unravel all of the heteronormative bullshit that they have grown up around. Even so, I, a queer, was still like very much so affected by it and very, very emotional about it. And it was just like, it was cute and heartwarming and it was about a father and a daughter and an uncle and a niece. And I was just like, oh, all of the lovely, lovely feelings. It was just like unmitigated and pure joy that only didn't receive five stars from me because I'm the kind of person who only rates something five stars if I want to go back and reread it. A book that I did give five stars to because I definitely want to go back and reread it is entitled How Male Privilege Hurts Women by Kate Mann. It is a nonfiction book, it is obviously a feminist text, and it is at its core about male entitlement. I have this book that I use as like a reading journal for a lack of a better term and it's basically where I like take notes as I'm reading if something like strikes my fancy. And let me tell you while most books only ever get one page, Entitled not only got this page but also these two pages and then this one here. I learned so many new terms to describe phenomena that I had like previously observed in the world and had like no way of like properly describing and each chapter talks about a different entitlement that men have in like patriarchal society. So we have entitled to admiration which talks all about like incels. Then she has entitled to sex where she introduces this concept of empathy which is like the excessive sympathy that we tend to have for male sexual assaulters which is a way to just like erase the victims by instead showering the perpetrator in sympathy. And the chapter that was called Entitled to Consent, the way she framed the issue, it blew my literal mind because she talks about how like patriarchy functions to make it so that men must not be denied, embarrassed, or made uncomfortable in any way, shape, or form by a woman. And let me tell you, when I like was reading that section, I had to like stand up, take a lap around my room, and then sit back down and start reading because I was like, I was so hyped up. I was like, she encapsulated the way in which women generally, but women of color and Asian women especially, have been taught to bend over backwards to cater to men and their like fragile egos. The entire section on like gender-based discrimination when it comes to medical care was also like a revelation. Like I learned so much new vocabulary in that section. Like the concepts of testimonial injustice and testimonial quieting, they live rent-free inside my brain. I think about them all of the time. And now that I work in the field of public health, I'm constantly thinking about like a health equity perspective and and it like it started with this book. This book is like what put me down the path of like gender in healthcare. What do you do about it? The framework of entitlement is such a like powerful and useful and fruitful framework. I feel like it, it tells you so much. Like I haven't even talked about there are like sections on how men feel entitled to bodily control, entitled to domestic labor, entitled to knowledge, entitled to power. Like every single chapter in this book like blows your mind in some way. It gives you like the tools to express the ways in which like patriarchy functions in society with both Entitled and Fearing the Black Body by Sabrina Strings. Like I want to at some point like buy copies of those books and like reread them and annotate and mark them up and like have them on my shelf for the rest of my life because they are honestly they were both like paradigm shifting educational books for me. I just realized like I think I'm not capable of getting ready and talking about books at the same time so I'm gonna pause here, finish the rest of my face, and then come back to talk about the rest of these books.
Whatever's on my face is also down in the description. It is always down in the description, at the very least like the point makeup is. But anyway, so the next novel that I read in 2021 according to the story graph was Pet by Akweke and Maisie. Now Pet is actually like a young adult slash middle grade novel and on the whole I just realized like middle grade and young adult novels are just not for me like I, I don't really enjoy them. <laughs> However I will say that of the three like middle grade slash young adult novels that I read this year Pet was probably the one that I enjoyed the most. I did give it 4.25 stars. So Pet is set in a... <sighs> that rhymed. Pet is set in a society in which like monsters don't exist anymore. Only our protagonist, a 15 year old trans girl, suddenly finds a monster one day. Sort of like the central tension of the book is like, well, how do you explain to adults that you have seen a monster and that a monster does exist when every single person in society around you keeps saying over and over again, monsters aren't real, they don't exist anymore. At the same time, it is also a book about monstrosity. Like what constitutes a monster? Pet is incredibly well written, it is incredibly nuanced, and it covers a lot of very like beautiful and important themes. This book also has so much to say about like denial and acceptance. Um, like I wrote down this quote from the book which goes, The truth is not a blade of grass to be bent by the wind of your hopes and desires. A thing that is happening happens whether you look at it or not. And yes, maybe it is easier not to look. I'm so excited to read any and everything Akweke and Maisie has to offer because they are clearly just such an incredibly talented writer. Okay, so next, according to the story graph, is My Brother's Husband, Volume 2, which I talked about when I talked about Volume 1 a bit back. Then the next thing I read was Good Omens, The Nice and Accurate Prophecies of Agnes Nutter Witch by Terry Pratchett and Neil Gaiman. So I read the book because at the same time, I also watched Good Omens, Omens the adaptation with David Tennant and Michael Sheen. And I ended up rating this book 3.5 stars. It's about an angel and a demon who have spent thousands and thousands and thousands of years on earth together. And having spent all of this time on earth they've grown to become fond of the earth. So when news comes that heaven and hell are about to trigger the apocalypse, the angel and the demon basically kind of like join forces to try and prevent the apocalypse from happening and preserve life as they know it on earth. The TV series does the premise better, it is funnier, it is more enjoyable, it is just a pure delightful little romp, and while I am infinitely grateful to Neil Gaiman and Terry Pratchett for having come up with the concept, I cannot in good conscience recommend the book over the TV series. Next up we have Red, White, and Royal Blue by Casey McQuiston, which I gave 3.75 stars. I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about this book because everyone and their mama knows what this book is about. The story is told from the perspective of Alex. He is the son of the first female president of the United States of America, and he ends up realizing that he is not a straight man. He is in fact a bisexual because he falls in love with the Prince of England. And as a fun gay little romance, it's good. It hits the spot. That's why I gave it 3.75 stars, but it's not so fun and so mind-blowing that I would ever want to like revisit it. And that's all also why it didn't get four stars and up. I do want to say as a side note that I definitely like rolled my eyes a little bit at the way in which Casey McQuiston went about trying to make the Prince of England kind of like woke about colonialism. Actually if I'm like perfectly honest with you I did not care for the Prince at all. The reason why this book has 3.75 stars is one I love all of Alex's friends. I also really really enjoyed Alex as a character. Like I felt like I could relate to him in so many different ways and not only is he a fellow bisexual but the pressure that he feels to perform and perform well at all times, as well as the way he uses that pressure to perform to sort of like really avoid dealing with all of his like personal shit. Whoo, it was like looking in a mirror. Like that was, it was very uncomfortable. I related very, very hard. And it is like literally McQuiston's characterization of Alex that to me like pushed this above like an average three star book. The next book on this list is Things We Lost in the Fire by Mariana Enriquez, translated by Megan McDowell from Spanish into English. I gave this book five stars. I also talked about it extensively in my like last book haul video that I'm going to link up in the cards. That video does have chapters so you can very easily find like exactly where I talked about Things We Lost in the Fire. But basically it is a collection of short stories. A lot of the stories have um, some sort of like a creepy horror element to them. Violence is definitely a feature. They are also stories which are about Argentinian society and politics. For example, in the story called The Invocation of the Big Eared Runt, which is about a guy who gives like a murder tour to tourists, Mariana Enriquez writes, 
Buenos Aires didn't have any great murderers, if you didn't count the dictators, not included in the murder tour for reasons of political correctness. The stories are also just very beautifully written, they're unsettling, they're creepy, a lot of them stayed with me for like months and months and months after I finished reading them, and I was just like so obsessed with them I actually ended up buying this book so that I could reread some of the stories. And it's just like it's a great short story collection. Now is it for everybody? I think no. There's definitely some like triggering content. One of the stories, like No Skin Over Our Bones, is definitely about an eating disorder, but I think if you are willing to read horror or are okay with a little bit of violence, I think these are very fascinating stories to dig into. They have a lot to say about Argentine society, a lot to say about gender and class and history and violence, not just on a small scale person to person level, but like the ways in which the state and society and class and capitalism carry out violence on people in our everyday lives. Despite me being determined to not talk a lot about this book right now because I've already talked so much about this book in one of my previous videos, here I am continuing to blabber about this book because honestly that's just how fascinating this is. I could talk to you about the things we lost in the fire for hours and hours and hours. Honestly it's why this book has five stars. Next up on the list, whereas Things We Lost in the Fire is definitely in like the top 10 pieces of fiction I read in 2021, this one is unfortunately in the bottom 10, and it is God in Pink by Hassan Namir. Hassan Namir is queer, like me. He is also an immigrant to Canada, like me, right? Like he's an Iraqi Canadian. So I just, I had such high hopes for this book. So the story is set in like the early 2000s in the middle of the Iraq war, and it's about this young gay man living in Iraq and he initially he makes plans to run away with his boyfriend to like flee the country to go someplace else so that they can like finally be in love out in the open and in the course of that happening the boyfriend dies let me just say it that way and then and this happens like right at the start of the novel so i'm not really spoiling anything and so now the protagonist plans to kind of like run away and be gay out in the open they're shot he has to stay in iraq he's just kind of like stuck here and so the story is told alternately from this young gay man's perspective as well as from the perspectives of I think like one of the imams in the mosque who is preaching against homosexuality and it just it ended up disappointing me because the characters they just kind of they felt very very flat it felt like a story that was more of an allegory than it was anything that was like real okay well, here's a small example but it was like one of those things where I'm just like this is not this is not realistic at all Rami's boyfriend dies you would absolutely expect him to be like super grieved and everything and he is for like five pages and then suddenly he like meets some new guy and is like super in love with him and basically like forgets all about his fucking boyfriend it's like that huge traumatic event that happens like right at the beginning where it's like he literally sees his boyfriend that he's about to run away with die in front of him like it never comes up again at all it's like it never happened he's just like infatuated with this like new boy now and I'm just like what are we doing here why have that big thing happen at the start of the story and then have it have no bearing later on it just it was a middling book and that's why I gave it kind of like three stars like 2.5 star for me is like damn that was mediocre and it didn't get that it got three so God in Pink actually brought up a lot of like really interesting discussions and conversations around like what it means to be Muslim and queer. And so in that sense I think like Hassan Namir did a, a really good job and it's why I gave the novel three stars. It is I believe like his debut novel so I'm cutting the guy a bit of slack here you know like and I'm actually very very eager to see like what kinds of books uh, Hassan Namir comes out with next. Okay the next book that I read in 2021 was The Night Diary by Vera Hiranandani. I basically read it I think to complete some sort of like reading challenge that required me to read a middle grade novel and I ended up rating it 3.5 stars mostly because it is a story about partition which I realized for people in the west when I say partition like their immediate association is like the Beyonce song no I'm, I'm talking about the partition of India and Pakistan that happened post British independence it was a very violent and traumatic event on all sides like no matter what religious or ethnic group you belong to like you did some shit and you had some shit happen to you nobody won in that exchange it was a terrible traumatic rift in South Asian history which has ramifications going on to this day and and the author Vira Hiranandani. Her last name suggests that she's Sindhi just like my grandparents were which means odds are that her own family much like my family had to move from Pakistan to India because they were not Muslim. And what the author has done here is she has written a middle grade story about a, 
Similarly, a family living in Pakistan that is not Muslim. She's written about the sort of like journey that this family is forced to make from Pakistan to India. And so it's written in this sort of like diary format from the perspective of this young girl as she's trying to sort of like navigate her way through the horrors of partition without fully recognizing like what's going on because you know when you're a child like you have no conception of why people are being mean to you just because you believe in like one set of gods over another. I, and I think it did a really good job at writing like a compelling narrative that explains partition to a young audience but um, I still could not give it more than 3.5 stars because this is the book that made me realize like I don't care how compelling of a book it is, I don't care how many awards it has won, like I have outgrown middle grade and young adult novels. Okay next up on the list we have Buried Words, The Diary of Molly Applebaum by Molly Applebaum. This is another nonfiction book, it is a memoir that I had to read for my History of the Holocaust class. Much like the Journal of Elaine Bear, I ended up not rating it because it just it doesn't seem fair to do that. I will say that Molly Applebaum is actually a survivor. Um, she's alive and well and living in Canada to this day. She actually talked to our class via Zoom after we had read this book and it was truly like such an incredible experience. So Molly's birth name is actually Melania and she and her cousin, both of whom are Jewish, they hid underground under the floor of the barn of like a Polish Christian farmer. And prior to going underground and while she was underground, Molly was able to like keep a diary of her thoughts to kind of like pass the time. And it is just a fascinating memoir because it complicates the ways in which we think about Polish Christians and about saviors who like hid Jewish people from the authorities. If you're interested in this particular period in history, Buried Words gets my highest recommendation. The next two books I read were also for that same history course. Um, they were for like my, the final paper I was writing for that course and they were um, the Auschwitz Sonderkommando Testimonies, Histories, Representations by Nicholas Chair and Dominic Williams as well as we Wept Without Tears, Testimonies of the Jewish Sonderkommando from Auschwitz by Gideon Grief. Both of these books and my final paper actually dealt with the Sonderkommando, which was the name given by German soldiers to the groups of people responsible for doing all of the like terrible dirty work in camps. For example, shaving people's heads, operating the crematoria, sorting through the clothes of the dead, pulling out gold teeth from bodies, all of these like horrifying and terrible tasks, they were done by these special units of prisoners called Sonderkommandos. Very very few of them survived after the war because they were deliberately killed by German soldiers to try and hide what was going on at all of these different camps. Because if you're curious to learn more about the Sonderkommando, because I was like fascinated by them when I learned about them in history class, that's why I wrote my final paper on them. I think the more interesting book if you want to learn more about this topic is We Wept Without Tears by Gideon Grief, because that actually contains full-blown interviews with surviving members of the Auschwitz Sonderkommando. And I personally was much more heavily impacted and I got so much more out of the experience of reading testimonies, like the actual transcripts and interviews along with the context that um, Gideon Grief provides than I did when I was reading the much sort of like drier academic text by Nicholas Chair and Dominic Williams. That's all I'm gonna say about that. I can guarantee you that nothing else on this list has anything to do with that very very dark period of history because this was what I read for my final paper and then I was done and then I graduated. So let's move on to the next book that I read of my own volition and that is How to Pronounce Knife by, oh I'm gonna mispronounce this name but my gut instinct is saying Suvankam Tamavangsa. And Suvankam Tamavangsa is a Lao author who I believe immigrated to Canada as a child. And How to Pronounce a Knife is basically a short story collection about the Lao immigrant experience. So it's not like a memoir, it's not nonfiction. These are all fictional stories um, about Lao immigrants trying to assimilate into society. And I ended up giving the short story collection four stars because like most short story collections, it's a little bit inconsistent. I think I read How to Pronounce a Knife in like June so almost six or seven months ago and the two stories that still exist vividly in my head I think one is called like Randy Travis the other one is about picking worms and those two stories and actually like all of the stories in the short story collection I think the thing that Suvankam Tamavangsa does incredibly well is that they have captured that sense of in-betweenness and awkwardness and not belonging that characterizes the immigrant experience. 
and, and the incredible thing about the short story collection is that it spans like the entire range of the experience. So there are a lot of stories that are about that intense first culture shock, like when you arrive somewhere and you have no idea what the hell is going on. But then there are also stories about immigrants who have lived in a place for a really long time and yet still struggle to find ways to like fit in and belong. And there are also stories about like the distance that begins to take place between immigrant parents and immigrant children as each try to reconcile the fact that the other is from a completely different society and culture than the first. And the way that like immigrant children feel such a immense sense of like loyalty and obligation to their parents while at the same time trying to like break free from and distance potentially like harmful ways of being that their parents are like imposing on them. It's just like the when the stories in How to Pronounce Knife hit they really hit. And I think like Suvankam Tamavangsa is just like an incredibly talented writer and she really like she hit my immigrant heart like right in the chest a bunch of times while I was reading which is why I gave it four stars. The next book that I read which I also gave four stars to is I'm Afraid of Men by Vivek Shreya. So Vivek Shreya is a South Asian Canadian trans woman. So I'm Afraid of Men is nonfiction. It's a memoir. It's very very short. It's like not even a hundred pages long and it basically talks about the relationship that Vivek Shreya has had to men throughout her entire life. She was at one point living as a man before she transitioned into living as a woman and so how did her relationship to masculinity and maleness change throughout her life? How did she learn from a very young age, even while living ostensibly as like a man, to be afraid of men and masculinity as a whole? It was a very very quick read. I think I read it in like one sitting. I read a lot of feminist literature and queer literature and I think Shreya like wasn't covering a lot of new ground and that's why I gave it like four stars instead of five. But I think if you are just like dipping your toes in feminist literature and queer literature and trans literature and you want something like short and interesting but punchy, I think I'm Afraid of Men is probably like a very very good starting point. Next up we have, <laughs> oh my god I just realized this is such a funny coincidence, but we have another book by a person also called Vivek. Instead of Vivek Shreya, this time it is Vivek Shanbhag. So Vivek Shanbhag is a highly acclaimed South Indian author and I think he originally wrote this book Kachar Gochar in Kannada if I'm not mistaken. It's translated into English by Srinath Perur. The title Kachar Gochar, it's like not really like a proper term in Kannada. It's a made-up phrase that one of the family members in this story uses to describe situations in which things get so tangled up together that there is no hope of ever separating them again. And boy what an absolutely tangled and spectacular web this story is. This is another very very short novel. It's another novel that I read in one sitting and it's about like a poor family that lives in Bangalore in India that manages to kind of drag themselves out of poverty into like middle class or upper middle classness. So the entire novel is filled with this sense of class insecurity and fear of falling back into poverty because they've just sort of like barely managed to scrape their way out of being poor and they're acutely aware that like one wrong move could throw them right back into the way that they used to live. The narrator of the story who is like a little bit unreliable and honestly like not a very great guy like he espouses some misogynistic ideas, he's a little bit of like a slacker, like essentially what happens is like after after the family ends up making their way into the middle class, the narrator marries a middle class woman who has always been a middle class woman. She has never known like financial insecurity in the way that the narrator and his family have. And so what the novel really is about is about the sort of like clash that occurs between the narrator and his kind of like background and family and his wife and her background and her ideals and her conception of the way in which the world should be run. And the characterization is just chef's kiss. Like truly the way in which the characters treat women and dismiss them is so instantly recognizable to anybody who's ever lived in India. Like there, that misogyny is like it's so palpably real. The way people talk about money and class and society and like what will the neighbors say like it is such a vivid and accurate portrayal of life in India. And the ending of this novel with the wife it haunts me to this day. I think about it all the time. Like I cannot say anything more because like I don't want to spoil it but honestly like gotcha culture I read it in like one sitting in one afternoon and it has never left me ever since. Genuinely just like such an incredible book and if anything by Vivek Shanbhag ever gets translated to English again I will read it. 
Okay, next up we have a poetry collection by Morgan Parker called There Are More Beautiful Things Than Beyonce. And I ended up rating this book three stars. I was trying to complete a reading challenge on the story graph. And the reading challenge like demanded that I read some like poetry book. And so I just, in order to fulfill a reading challenge requirement, picked up this book to read it. And given that I rated it three stars and the lowest rated book I read this entire year was only 2.5 stars, I think what this poetry collection taught me is like reading challenges are not for me. When I like force myself to read something just to complete a challenge and not because I have any sort of like intrinsic interest to read it, I'm just like, I'm not really gonna like it. I think if you enjoy poetry, you will probably really like There Are More Beautiful Things Than Beyonce. Like that's a hell of a title, right? Like I'm, I'm sure it is a very, very good collection of poetry, but I was just like not in the right headspace when I read it. And so like, I don't remember a single thing about this. And clearly I did not have like a fun time because I was just trying to like knock it out in order to finish a reading challenge challenge, which is the wrong reason to read books. But let's move on to the next book, which is Such a Fun Age by Kylie Reed. I love this book. I gave this book 4.5 stars and it honestly, it deserves every last one of them. The characters in Such a Fun Age are masterfully done. The humor in Such a Fun Age is masterfully done. And Kylie Reed manages to take very, very serious topics in society. So like the intersections of race and class and gender and performative allyship and the fetishization of black women and the ways in which like some mothers have very like fraught intense relationships with their children because they so clearly have a favorite child. Like all of these really intense and seemingly serious sounding elements are in such a fun age and they are beautifully and incredibly explored without the novel being like a serious tragic snooze fest. I just realized I haven't even told you guys what the story is about. So Amira is like a 25 year old black woman who is a babysitter for this white family. So the inciting incidents is that the Chamberlains, the white family, so the dad who's like a news reporter, he says some like racially insensitive shit while on the broadcast. And because of that, their house gets kind of like attacked. Like I think it gets egged or maybe like a brick gets thrown through it. I can't remember. So they call the police, but then because they don't want their like daughter to be like traumatized or be unsafe, they also call their babysitter. Amira and they're like Amira please there's like an emergency if you could please come pick Briar up take her out of the house for a little bit while we like deal with the police and everything and Amira being like fine I will do this for the money she shows up to pick Briar up with her friend Zara and they go to like a grocery store down the street right this is some like posh bougie white ass grocery store and Amira it should be noted because she just came from a birthday party she's dressed for a club and while they're at the grocery store some like Karen basically alerts the security guard that she thinks Amira has kidnapped Briar and so the security guard comes up and harasses Amira. He threatens to call the police. He's like very kind of like terrifying. And Amira ends up having to call like Mr. Chamberlain, the dad, and have him like come and confirm that like, no, she did not kidnap Briar. She's literally just his babysitter. And this whole incident is recorded on video by a white guy called Kelly. And so this is the inciting incident for everything else that kind of happens in the novel. But honestly, like the novel is not just about this incident. It is about so much more than that. Like the story is told in rotating perspectives. So Amira is narrating it half the time, but the other half of the time, the story is told from the perspective of the white mom, Alix. And Alix is basically like a girl boss influencer, right? She's like a sort of like a Rachel Hollis, Sheryl Sandberg type of a lady who used to be this like posh little influencer in New York and who has now been like forced to move to Philadelphia and is kind of struggling with being like a mom and still trying to be like relevant. And so in order to kind of like stay relevant to like young people and also because of this like whole hoopla that happened in the grocery store, she kind of becomes desperate to try and be like friends with Amira. I devoured this book in like a day and a half. I could not put it down. Like I can totally see why like people loved it for book clubs because there's like a lot to discuss here. Never have I seen such a simultaneously sympathetic and scathing portrayal of white liberal tomfoolery. Like, huh. The next book I have on this list is The Haunting of Hill House. So Shirley Jackson wrote in the late 1950s and early 1960s. I actually had never read any of her works. Um, and Netflix actually came out with an adaptation of The Haunting of Hill House, which I ended up watching first. And then I went back and I decided to go read the original novel. Now, here's the thing, the TV series, The Haunting of Hill House, and the original novel, The Haunting of Hill House, honestly have like nothing to do with each other. And I don't just mean in terms of plot, I mean in terms of theme. Because I think while the Netflix adaptation like explores a lot of really, really interesting 
themes around like death and dying and grief. It does it kind of at the expense of the feminist core of the Haunting of Hill House novel. It kind of almost decenters the women. While it rotates through the perspectives of each of the different family members, it's really about the one son who is like a skeptic. Like he's who the story opens with and he's also who the story closes with. He's the one who has like the biggest character arc, blah blah blah, whatever. And it kind of makes sense to some extent because the showrunners of the Netflix show, like the, the guy whose like main idea it was, like he is a guy. Whereas like when you read The Haunting of Hill House, you are very much so aware that it is a novel written by a woman. It is a novel that I think could not have been written by anyone but a woman. I don't know if I'm really making like sense right now. Let me see if I like wrote anything down in my like notes that like is mo more coherent than the way that I feel. There is something distinct about female-led, female-written gothic horror or horror generally. There is a claustrophobia explicitly linked to the domestic sphere. The house as an entity that's malevolent, destructive, and hungry. It consumes Nell as a person, the way houses and domesticity consumed women at this time. Even Mrs. Dudley is ruled and run by the house's demands. She must clear the table at ten. The silver must be polished and returned to the drawers. The house demands of her, Mrs. Dudley. It demands of Nell. It demands of all women. And it's this demand, command, and call which is destructive and devouring. And given everything that we know about like Shirley Jackson, like the author's life history and the way in which she had like a very troubled and messed up marriage and she eventually ended up being like agoraphobic. She was literally like trapped in her own home. I just think like the observation that I made there about, you know, the sort of like the feminist horror of the domestic sphere, I just think like that's not as much of a reach as it might seem. I don't know if that is like a common reading of The Haunting of Hill House. I really like should look into it because I'm sure people have done feminist readings of The Haunting of Hill House, but that is just something that like occurred to me. And the writing is also superb and poetic and haunting, like truly. It actually like really made me want to read more gothic fiction and specifically more gothic fiction written by women. And so honestly, while I did rate it four stars at the time, now that I'm really thinking about it, I think I actually want to maybe bump it up to like a 4.5 because it was such a like formative book in terms of shaping my reading taste for the rest of the year. Next up we have uh, I'm Telling the Truth But I'm Lying by Basi Ikpi. So Basi Ikpi is a Nigerian-American author and this is a non-fiction essay collection slash memoir about her life. I ended up rating this book 4.5 stars but let me tell you this book really fucked me up. <laughs> So Basi Ikpi was born and raised in Nigeria before moving to the United States as a child. And then as an adult, after having like a very sort of prolonged and intense breakdown, she was diagnosed as having bipolar 2 disorder. And now she's like a mental health activist. And this set of essays, I'm telling the truth but I'm lying, it not only spans kind of like her childhood in Nigeria, but her mental health diagnosis and what it means to be black and the children of immigrants and then also mentally ill. And then having to sort of come to terms with all of that as an adult to then try and function. This book, <laughs> it was like a punch to the fucking chest. It is such a devastatingly beautiful book to read, but it was also such a difficult book to read because it was so difficult to see all of the sort of like impulses and depressive tendencies that I've tried so hard to like fix in myself being explored so rawly by Bossy AP. I don't have bipolar 2, but I have ADHD. And like Bossy, I wasn't diagnosed until I was in my mid 20s and after I had had like a prolonged breakdown going on for like years and years and years. Because I don't just have ADHD, I also have um, like depression and anxiety and shit. And so this is one of those books that was just, it was like uncomfortably familiar. There's this moment where Bossy's writing about how she was in denial about her diagnosis of bipolar 2 and specifically about the fact that she was going to have to be on medications for the entire rest of her life to manage this disease, right? Because she was like, no, 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 no. That's just like a legal disclaimer for other people. Me personally, I'm just gonna be on this medication for a short little while and I'm gonna somehow like get my life together and then I can get off them and be like a normal person because I've like fixed my life. And when I was reading that, the flame of like hot burning recognition that just lit up in my chest, I had to put the book down. I had to go take a walk. I like cried a little and then I came back and I picked up the book because I'm like, girl, 
fucking same. Like to this day, some part of my mind is still in denial about the fact that like I have ADHD and I'm gonna have it for the rest of my life, right? That this is maybe something that I will have to be medicated for for the rest of my life. That there is no sort of like fix to this. There is no cure. Like this is just the way that I am. This is a thing that I'm gonna have to manage from now until the day that I die. If, if anybody is ever like, Prachi, like, how do you feel about your ADHD? Like, could you ever explain to me? I will just like quietly hand them this book and I'll be like, read this, you will know. Every single feeling that like Bossy undergoes in this book, her feeling of shame, her feeling of trying to distance herself from like other people with mental illness because she's not crazy like them, it's just so painfully familiar. The only reason I did not give this book five stars is because, because I don't know that I have the courage to like see myself on a page like that again. You know, and if, if that makes me a coward, it makes me a coward. But like my inability to, I think, put myself through rereading this book is the only reason why this book does not have five stars. But if you, like me, are a person with a long-standing mental health issue and, and you have the emotional bandwidth and you feel like you want to be seen and heard, there is, there is no book in the world I could recommend that is better than this one. Okay, it is 1.28 in the morning and I still have three books to go before I hit the halfway point of like 26 books and I stop this video. So let's speed it up. So the next book that I read in 2021 was The Lost Apothecary by Sarah Penner, which I have no recollection of reading this book or what the hell it was about. And yet I gave it 3.5 stars. So um, let me look at my little like reading journal and see if I wrote anything about it because honestly, the fact that I can't remember anything about this novel well, that honestly says everything, doesn't it? So I said, fun book, read it all in one sitting. That must be why I gave it like 3.5 stars. Found Caroline's choices slash personality slash inability to just tell people things very annoying. Enjoyed the other two perspectives. Oh, okay, no, wait, I remember this. I think this is like a piece of historical fiction and it's told through like rotating perspectives. There's a woman living in the present, like an American woman who goes to London. And then there's, I think like two perspectives that are like in the past. The the women in the past, they were these apothecaries who like made concoctions for other women, including like poisons that could like kill their husbands and like all this kind of stuff. It's very, um, if you guys have ever seen um, the Bailey Sarian murder mystery or makeup episode about um, Aqua Tofana, it's it's like very much so that energy and so I was super interested in like the apothecary ladies who were actually doing some like aqua tofana type shit and I was like very much so not interested in the contemporary lady having like marital problems or whatever and trying to solve the mystery of what happened to these old school ladies. Next up on the list we have Ghost Squad by Claribel A. Ortega. This is another middle grade novel. It's actually like a fantasy middle grade novel. I have talked at length in this video about how like middle grade is just not my jam and that is why I also gave this like a three star. And now for the 26th book that I read in 2021 and the last book that I will be addressing in this video part one we have The Turn of the Screw by Henry James. This is actually a novella. It's like barely a hundred pages long and I rated it three stars because honestly remember thinking to myself especially because I had just finished reading The Haunting of Hill House that I thought it was hella boring. The only reason I ended up picking up The Turn of the Screw was because the sequel to The Haunting of Hill House, The Haunting of Bly Manor, is very loosely based on The Turn of the Screw by Henry James. And let me tell you, The Haunting of Bly Manor is much better than The Turn of the Screw in pretty much every possible respect, not least of which is lesbians. So <laughs> I very rarely write written reviews in Storygraph, but Turn of the Screw is one of the like few novels for which I actually wrote something in Storygraph itself as a review. So I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to read this and we're going to cap this video off. So here is my three star review of The Turn of the Screw by Henry James as posted on the Storygraph. No one ever says anything outright because they're all hideously British and repressed. And I don't know if that's James making a statement or trying to build tension, but I thought it was just okay. Ends rather abruptly. And then, much like James, I end my own review rather abruptly because that's it. That's literally all I wrote. And that is all from me for now, folks, because it is nearly two in the morning. I have covered the first half of all of the books that I read in 2021. So I'm going to take off this makeup, go to sleep, and film part two of this video tomorrow. As always, thank you so, so much for watching, and I hope you have an amazing upcoming week. Take care of yourselves. Bye!